They say it's the fish of 10,000 casts. Today, we're in Maplewood State Park in search of the apex predator lurking beneath Minnesota waters, the muskie. Brandon Olson is from Lockjaw Guide Service in Ottertail County and spends a lot of time on the water chasing muskies. You gotta really go big. The more, the bigger of an oval you can draw or bigger the zero, it's more room for that fish to turn and kind of ambush that bait. You'll, a lot of times you'll see them, they'll come around and they'll almost hesitate under your feet. And when you come up out here, they'll shoot out and grab it. They don't have to eat everything that comes by them like a small pike or walleye or bass or something like that. They can be real choosy. So that's where the, the curiosity comes in. They wanna make sure it's something they wanna eat before they jump on it. So top of the food chain, that's where there's no fear in these fish. That's what makes them so fun to catch. Oh, there's a muskie. There's a muskie right here. He came up and then he swam back down. Well, that was quick. I was just getting it this bucktail back to the boat here and just about to start a figure eight or a big loop here next to the boat when I saw the fish and then our first sighting right away. What have we been out here fishing? 10 minutes? Yeah, maybe. 30 casts? Yeah. I thought they were the fish of 10,000 casts, Brandon. They're the fish of one cast, but sometimes it makes 9,999 9, to get there. I always joke that a good day musky fishing is seeing one. This is Beers Lake, one of eight major lakes nestled into the 9,250 acre Maplewood State Park. A fishing license isn't necessary for Minnesota residents, but you will need a park pass. With the new moon today, this is, this is the day in September. Generally speaking, all your big fish get caught either on the new moon or full moon. Um, and new moon usually provides better daytime fishing. There's no hard rules in muskie fishing because they can do whatever they want, but there's kind of some guidelines. So you mainly uh, a musky guy, or do you, you kind of a multi-species, or whatever? Uh, multi-species, I would say muskies are probably my favorite, but do a lot, of, a lot of walleye trips throughout the year, a lot of crappies and bass. But once you became a musky angler, I didn't think you could afford to do anything else. <laughs> you could buy about six, six bass boats with what you got in that musky <laughs> tackle box right there. I ended up starting to make a lot of my own lures. Oh, really? Just because of that. You know, they're 50 bucks a piece. So am I fishing with one of your own creations then? That's McLovin. <laughs> now, this is probably the most important musky question I'm gonna ask you today. Who gets to name the, the lures? Because that's... <laughs> I don't, some of these I think people get out to a party and <laughs> wait till about <laughs> two in the morning and then start naming baits. Sounds like a good time. So it was 39 degrees when we drove up here this morning. Fall is uh, is beginning. And I'm curious, Randon, what, you know, when the air temp drops like that and the water temperatures start to drop, how does that affect muskies? More times than, it, than not, it actually kicks them up a little bit. And sure. I, I'm not sure, you know, their instincts are kind of to put the feed bag on for fall and get everything ripened up for winter. but. I'm not sure if it has something to do with the other fish species slowing down a little bit during cold fronts or what it is. Oh, but, that makes they, sense. They kind of seem to, to kind of kick it into another gear almost during cold fronts. Like all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, that fish is just sitting there. I'm going to eat him. Right. You just never know with muskies. No. Nope. always have to be paying attention, always looking in the water. You never know when there's going to be a fish behind whatever presentation you got out there. And we just finished our first spot here. We came in and worked around this island and back into this bay right here. We did see one fish. Randy was saying he averages about a fish an hour a lot of times. On a, on a good day, that's what you were saying? Yep. You'll see a fish an hour. So we've seen one here in the first hour. We're, now we're going to move to the next spot. So we're out of the miner now. One thing, I don't really change a whole lot when I get out of the miner. I still want to fish faster. I just like to try to be able to find fish. You can get them to rise up. You come back and you get that little wind change or cloud cover, whatever. It, it's weird what'll trigger them. You know, sometimes it's the smallest thing, like just the cloud goes in front of the sun, all of a sudden they'll get active for five minutes. 
Musky fishing involves a lot of patience, expensive baits, and a boatload of luck. This is a pose jackpot. This is my all-time favorite musky lure to throw. I've never caught a fish on it. <laughs> in 15 years. This would be the time to catch one on it. Uh-huh. Once again, his favorite lure proved to be unlucky, but his next choice was a different story. Two of them, two of them. Double, come on. Double follow, that's awesome. Two mid 40s, they're a good fish. While those two fish gave us some excitement, Randon realized what our problem was. You gotta have a sinking lure stuck in the net. <laughs> You're a little superstitious, aren't you? Yeah, you gotta be, the musky fish. Whenever we first started, we'd always hook a fish when the net's buried under tackle boxes and you're not ready. Once we started learning to you get your net ready before you even leave the access, you'd go through dry spells where you wouldn't, wouldn't see nothing, wouldn't catch nothing. So we thought, well, maybe we gotta go back to having the net hard to get at. So we started throwing lures in the net and it would work. It has to be a sinking lure. You can't throw a topwater and there's something that you're gonna be able to just get back. You have, you have to be willing to lose it and, and you can't place it. You have to just throw it wherever it lands, that's it. Well, that's a superstition I've never heard of before, <laughs> but it worked. Not a giant, but a good starter fish. Oh, there we go. Hey, all right, on the board. Nice. Not a big one, but it's musky. Good, it's a musky, it's a good start. Got this one casting a Medusa, uh, it's a big rubber bait. They work really good in the fall. Um, we're in that fall transition time here where kind of a lot of different things are working. You just got to figure out what they want each day. So this is a really nice true musky. A lot of times you'll get these spots on the smaller ones for a while and they'll clear up kind of when they get older. but. Beautiful fish here. Nice big sharp teeth on her. Yeah, she's a gorgeous fish. She's gonna be big some days. Get her back in the water and let her go. So today is the new moon. Generally speaking, most of your big fish that you hear getting caught of every year are either on the new moon or the full moon. They say the new moon's better for daytime. And the full moon's better nighttime. I think it's a lot to do with like the pressure in the sky and stuff. It's the lunar tables is what it goes off of the tides out of the ocean. I blame aliens. That's <laughs> and Bigfoot. Over the next couple of hours, we hit each part of the lake, trying out a number of different presentations. Oh yeah, he's still there. Yep. Oh, we yeah. nipped it. But the big fish just wouldn't commit. Oh. <sighs> Hate musky fishing. <laughs> <laughs> While we hadn't caught any muskies on it, there was one lure in particular that was getting their attention. The Tinkerbell, it's not completely my idea. It's completely homemade, it's uglier than sin. The fish like it, it works good, it's a heavy bait. Let's explain why that bait is so heavy. <laughs> so back in high school, uh, my shop teacher had made kind of a, it's a fake musket, but he used like, made a wood stock, put conduit for, for the barrel on it and everything, and he had to make something to make a ball for it, you know. They milled out a chunk of aluminum into a round ball to fit into that. Well, they never used that mold again, so I took the mold home, and that's what we made the head of Tinkerbell out of. So it's just a, it's a, I don't even know what caliber that would be, but <laughs> it's, it's a big one. Musky caliber. Musky caliber. Tinkerbell tantalized the muskies to some degree, but did not have the mesmerizing effect that Medusa did. Oh! <laughs> Still got him? Yeah, yeah, he's up pretty good. We got there, Randon. Nice muskie. Oh yeah, it is. Oh, I guess she's barely hooked. 
I'm gonna play her kind of easy. She's just hooked in the side. Okay. And we got her. All right. Woo. That's a little better one. Nice. Nice. That is a gorgeous fish. What I've heard over the years, and, and I don't know for sure, but I've heard that a 40 inch muskie is about 10 years old and that they'll grow quick till they hit 40. Um, and then they slow up after that. So 44, probably 13 years old, 14 years old, something like that. It's really amazing how an experience with one big muskie can really change a guy's opinion on wanting to chase him, you know? Literally hook a guy into muskie fishing. My, my best analogy is it's catch and release deer hunting. <laughs> yeah. It's that same feeling when you're sitting in your deer stand, you're tired of watching squirrels, and all of a sudden that big buck walks out and your knees start shaking, and it's the same feeling when you see that muskie. Muskie fever. Muskie fever.